Hello, we are delighted you've joined us for today's live webinar and keynote presentation where innovation and regulation meet. I am Christina Mahalik of Labroots and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars. To learn more, visit labroots.com. Let's get started. You can post questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them in the Q&A box, which will open when you click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window or report the problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the screen. This is an educational webinar, thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left hand corner of the webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Laura Koontz, PhD, Personalized Medicine Staff at the Food and Drug Administration, Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Dr. M. Koontz, PhD, is a member of the Personalized Medicine Staff at the Food and Drug Administration in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Prior to joining the FDA, she was Director of Policy for the Ovarian Cancer National Alliance, where she oversaw congressional and regulatory policy, including issues pertaining to use and regulation of genetic technologies. Prior to that, she was an American Society of Human Genetics, Genetics and Public Policy Fellow from 2012 to 2013, and worked in the House of Representatives on issues related to genetic testing and genetic non-discrimination. Dr. Koontz holds a PhD in biochemistry, cellular and molecular biology from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Once again, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Koontz. Dr. Koontz, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you, Christina, and good morning to all of you. Um, it's my pleasure to talk to you for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, and then answer questions about some of our recent work regarding the regulation of next generation sequencing uh, tests. Um, as I mentioned, we'll, I'd be happy to take questions at the end, and please um, uh, ask them as you uh, come up with them. So, um, First, I'd like to take a step back and frame um, where a lot of this work that we've been doing over the last couple of years has come from. So, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, the Precision Medicine Initiative was announced a couple years ago um, with the goal of enabling a new era in medicine through research technology and policies that empower patients, researchers, and providers. So, what is the FDA's role here? Um, so, we work, to, it is our mission to um, both promote and pre protect the public health by regulating the safety and effectiveness of um, genetic tests in this case. So um, under the Precision Medicine Initiative, we have sought to develop an approach suited to the unique nature of current um, NGS tests and um, have been working to adapt our regulatory policies regarding these tests so that we meet our twin goals of promoting innovation in this space but also um, providing patients with safe and effective tests. And I'll talk quite a bit more about that um, later. Um, so, so there are several things that need to um, happen for precision medicine to be successful. So of course, um, patients need safe and accurate tests that reliably identify their variation and um, uh, make sure that that is clinically meaningful for them. Um, we need learning healthcare systems that enable researchers and clinicians to learn from all of this information that we're generating um, about genetic variation and disease. 
um, and help that, use that to inform patient experience. We need to develop targeted therapies that are more efficacious and have less deleterious side effects for patients based on their you know, specific genetic alterations. And of course, we will need to update research and regulatory policies to make sure that we're really capitalizing upon all of, the, all of this new research and um, development of new, tre uh, new treatments while doing our job to protect patients. So um, FDA's role in the PMI, as I hinted earlier, is really to implement new regulatory policies that promote research and accelerate the translation of precision medicine technologies into treatments that benefit patients. Um, and so the next, um, this sort of outlines what I'm going to talk to you about today. First, we need to develop and implement standards that assure that analytical tests, that the analytical quality of tests is met. So that is, do they measure what they say that they're going to measure in an accurate way? Um, we also um, support the use of publicly accessible genetic databases for evidence of clinical relevance of these genetic variants. So um, are we, um, are we crowdsourcing data generation about what an individual genetic variant might mean for a patient? And then finally, um, we are developing open source tools that help test the developers um, meet standards. So this is a platform that we've put together called Precision FDA, which I'll talk a little bit more about at the end of our talk today. Um, so as I mentioned, this sort of outlines what I'm going to talk to you about today. So first, I'm going to discuss a two draft guidances, the first which um, addresses how we have been thinking about developing analytical standards to make sure that um, test developers can assure the analytical validity of their tests. Second, I'll talk about a second draft guidance which um, discusses how test developers can leverage publicly accessible da databases to support the um, clinical relevance of their tests. And then third, I'll talk about Precision FDA which is our platform for bioinformatics. Okay, and so um, just to give you a little background on um, FDA, as I'm not sure how many folks on are familiar with um, what we do here and how we actually evaluate tests. So you can think about um, the need for a new paradigm for next generation sequencing tests because it's so different than all of the different diagnostics that have come before it. So conventional diagnostics, you know, single gene assays, for example, um, have a low or medium resolution. Um, they usually detect a couple of different analytes, maybe, maybe all of the different variants within a gene, or maybe even just a handful of variants in a gene, you know, known to be causative in cancers, for example. Um, usually a test has a single disease indication and the evidence used um, by a test developer to support um, that test um, in a pre-market submission is usually gathered by the sponsor itself, or they may um, be able to leverage um, literature as well. So next generation uh, sequencing based tests really blow that whole paradigm open. Um, obviously these tests use um, high resolution technology generating um, millions of pieces of information about, you know, every, every variant in the, you know, every base pair in the genome, and um, you might get information back about thousands of individual variants that you, that you might have. Um, the same test can be used in many different diseases, so we break apart that one test, one disease paradigm. Um, and then, obviously, because there's so much unknown about um, about um, the individual genetic variants that we all harbor, um, it's necessary to use crowdsourced uh, data to generate the evidence necessary to um, support a pre-market submission for one of these tests, or it may be necessary to do so. Um, so when the FDA reviews um, a test um, for um, prior to it being marketed, we generally look at a couple different things. So the first is analytic validity, and this is what our first guidance focuses on and I'll talk an awful lot about today. So does the test correctly detect the analytes that it claims to? 
how precise is that test, what are the limits of detection or measurement if there are any. Um, you know, if a sample is very dilute, can you not get a good read on it, for example. Um, the second thing we look at is clinical validity. So does the test um, correctly identify a disease or condition? So you may say, for example, um, a, blood, a blood glucose test um, may, analytic, may be analytically valid. It might correctly detect the level of glucose in your blood. Um, and if you are looking at diabetes, that's clinically valid. Obviously, there's a lot of literature out there that shows that those two things are related. If you're running a blood glucose test and looking at um, whether or not you might have cancer, that's not clinically valid. So, so clinical validity is sort of the clinical relevance of whether the variant you're looking at, in this case, vari genetic variant or analyte, um, has any clinical relevance to disease that you're claiming. Um, we would also look at the clinical sensitivity, specificity, and predictive values. And, um, and um, by statute, um, clinical validity must be assessed um, and relies upon valid scientific evidence, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, what, our, what our definition of valid scientific evidence is. Um, finally, uh, we would also look at the labeling um, around a test, so not only um, what, a, what a test developer might say or promote about a test, but also are the directions for use clear? Is what you say about the test truthful and not misleading? And of course, all of this is based on the intended use of the test, so, so what you as a test developer are claiming the test is used for. Okay. So first we'll talk about our analytical um, standards draft guidance, um, which we published in July of last year. Um, it's entitled, The Use of Standards in FDA Regulatory Oversight of NGS-Based In Vitro Diagnostics, or tests, um, used for diagnosing germline diseases. And um, I'll give a quick overview of this guidance and then talk about some of the nitty gritty of it and how we arrived at um, um, where we did. But I just wanna say briefly that um, we have, for the past couple of years, been engaging um, with the community to develop these guidances. We've hosted um, four workshops and had a number of different webinars and white papers and have solicited quite a bit of public feedback about the, um, the guidances that we put forward. Um, I'll mention that they're in draft, and so all of the recommendations in them are just that, they're a draft. They're not legally enforceable, and nothing that I'm going to discuss here today is for implementation. We, of course, um, continue to be interested in engaging on public feedback regarding these guidance documents. And so, um, you know, as we move forward with these projects, look forward to continuing to engage with you and the community around, around this work. So, um, in summary, this draft guidance um, has a very limited scope. First, it's applicable only to um, germline whole exome sequencing or targeted panels, and I'll talk a little bit more about the scope in a minute. Um, it makes a series of technical recommendations for how next generation sequencing test developers can design and then validate their tests um, to demonstrate that they're analytically valid. It accommodates different test designs, components, and indications. Um, so we, we hope that it's a very flexible approach and, and lots of different test developers can use it um, so it's not sort of a one-size-fits-all paradigm. Um, and we hope that this can form the basis of future FDA-recognized standards or special controls. And we'll talk quite a bit more about that later. Um, um, but FDA um, typically will regulate or will recognize standards, and um, these are consensus documents that are put out by the community um, around things like analytical validity. So we'll talk a little bit more about the implications that that has for test developers. And then finally, um, the guidance discusses a potential expedited path to market for tests that can meet these standards. So first, the, um, the, the scope of this guidance document, it applies only to targeted or whole exome sequencing NGS-based tests that are intended to aid, phys to aid in the diagnosis of individuals with a suspected germline disease or other conditions. 
So it's a pretty limited scope. We wanted to, um, we thought when, when applying this new paradigm about how we would evaluate a test, rather than looking analyte by analyte, looking at the test that detects multiple analytes as a whole, we really wanted to bite off a narrow, um, a, a narrow indication at first, just to make sure that we were thinking about the right things and what we propose is feasible for the community. Um, so when test developers um, approach analytical validation of their tests, there are two um, general approaches that they could take. So the first, um, on, the, on the left hand side of this um, continuum, uh, discusses performance standards. And so these are the use of um, predefined acceptance criteria that a test would have to satisfy. Um, using this approach, um, FDA would um, provide test developers with specific targets that they would have to meet, but um, overall they'd be less flexible. So for example, we would um, provide specific benchmarks on accuracy and precision that a test developer would have to meet with their test. On the other side of the spectrum is the design concept approach where um, this outlines a process by which a test developer would design, develop, and validate a test iteratively and thus consistently be able to generate tests that meet their user needs um, with performance characteristics that allow for clinical interpretation. So for example, this would be end-to-end um, -end validation of a test um, if any criteria or components are changed. And um, we, we um, in our workshops leading up to the publication of these guidances, draft guidances, um, asked for stakeholder feedback on which of these approaches um, folks would prefer. And we actually heard that overwhelmingly, most people would prefer sort of a blend of the two. Um, they'd want some specific performance standards that, they, that a test would need to meet. And, and this is coming from test developers, you know, saying, you know, any any test that offers an accuracy below X threshold, we know it's not a good test and, and we really wouldn't want that out on the market. Um, and then also um, folks wanted uh, a, a blend of some of those design concepts there. So so not needing, not indicating, not needing to meet specific benchmarks for every single thing that you're going to measure, but being able to validate an entire test end to end. All right. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, the draft guidance provides a series of technical recommendations that describe the approach to the test design. Um, it's our goal for this to accommodate multiple different test designs, components, and indications, and so on. Um, and we hope that this can form the basis of special controls um, or FDA recognized standards in the future. So first, I'd like to talk a little bit about the test design. So at FDA, we think about um, or recommend that when a test developer is de um, designing a test, that they need to think about a couple different things. So they'll need to think about first their intended use. So what do they actually plan on this test being used for? Is it is it a targeted um, a targeted sequencing panel just to look? Um, for genetic alterations in kids with uh, suspected of hereditary hearing loss, for example, or do you want to look at um, the entire exome of um, children with uh, developmental uh, delays and, and just see what you find? Um, you want to think about what your user needs are. So, um, so what kind of um, specimen types are you getting? Um, what kind of information do parents or you know, physicians want back? Um, that kind of thing. You also need to think about what regions of the genome you're able to interrogate and at what um, what um, uh, coverage level. For example, do you know that there are um, regions of the genome um, with clinically relevant genes that you'd like to sequence, but you know that they're tough to sequence? So, so what do you do in that case? Um, you'll have to think about that feeds into the performance of your test. Um, and then um, you also need to think about what components and methods um, you have at your disposal to use in your test. And so all of these components influence your test's design. 
And so when thinking about validating a, a test using a design standards approach or design concept standards approach, um, you have to think about the test design feeding into the test performance. Um, so having encompassed all of that information and saying you need a test that runs at X specification um, and you know reports out information on these variant regions um, at X coverage, um, what kind of test performance do you need? And so how do you design a test to make sure that you get that performance? Um, you'll also probably want to have some predefined test run quality metrics. So how do you know if on a run level um, your test failed or not? So you'll want to de define those. You'll then use all of this information, assemble a test, and then validate it to make sure that it's meeting um, the criteria that you set forward when you designed your test in the first place. And so this is an iterative process and it might be the kind of thing that a test developer will need to step through a couple different times as they you know, develop their test to make sure that they're hitting all of the different, um, all of the different um, criteria that they, they would like to. And so um, the draft guidance um, discusses um, in, you know, in some detail how to do this process. Um, we also included some, as, as um, many folks asked for, um, some individual performance characteristics, so the other side of the, the continuum. Um, so we identified performance metrics and set minimally accepted values um, that a test developer would need to meet for the test to be considered analytically valid. Um, the guidance specifies four overall metrics that should always be assessed. First, the accuracy, and that could be by measuring the positive predictive value, negative predictive value, technical predictive value. Um, the precision, so by looking at the reproducibility and repeatability of the assay, um, we need to know the limit of detection. So um, below what coverage are you not confident in the calls that you're, you're generating, for example. And then um, we'd also look at the analytical specificity. So if you're doing a targeted panel and you know that there's cross-reactivity with pseudogenes of some of the things that you're looking for, how are you um, dealing with, with, um, with, with uh, minimizing that issue? We also provide general recommendations for um, studies to evaluate the performance. So, we define elements that should always be included in validation experiments. Um, so things that are important to FDA is that you should evaluate the performance end to end of your test. So if you change a component, um, you know, you change uh, the library prep or you change a piece of your bioinformatics pipeline, um, that could be considered um, uh, you know, a major component and you'd need to revalidate the test end to end. Um, we'd want to see validation um, from represent validation data from representative areas of the genome. So are you able to sequence, you know, easy to sequence regions? Are you able to sequence more difficult to sequence regions? So for example, uh, areas with high CG content, for example. Um, are you able to um, uh, to uh, find different variant types, so SNVs, um, small indels, structural variants, copy number variation, for example. Are you able to detect all of those? If not, that's that's probably, you know, if your test doesn't need to detect large structural variants, that's fine. Um, um, you would just need to say, say so. Um, if it does, and you want to you want to claim that you're able to detect those large structural variants, for example. You would need to have validation data to show that you could actually do so. Um, and again, obviously, you'd want to make sure that all of the areas that you're able to sequence and you're providing validation data for are related um, to the indication that your 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 test is trying to meet. Um, We'd also want to see, um, as I mentioned, that if there are certain things that you, your test cannot reliably detect with accurate accuracy, with adequate accuracy or precision, that you say so. So you define what limitations your test might have. Um, and then you'll want to um, provide validation data for 
all of the different specimen types that you intend to accept for your test and conduct um, communability studies if necessary. Um, um, finally, also test developers should determine the number of specimens required to validate all of these tests. Um, the guidance also provides some other recommendations. So um, recommendations are around when um, Sanger confirmation might be necessary to confirm a rare variant that you find. Um, this is not something that we'd want to see um, as part of a submission, um, but necessarily, but um, um, you should define when and, when and how it may need to be used um, and how that might affect your validation studies. Um, we also have some recommendations around variant annotation and filtering, um, how information should best about test performance should be presented on a test report, how um, results should be communicated clearly, and then finally, um, modifications. Um, so if you do change one of those critical components of your test, um, how you end-to-end -end validate to, make, to show that it's, um, it, it's uh, consistent with your test performance before the, the modification took place. So finally, um, we believe that all of these recommendations, um, uh, so before I talk about um, before I talk about that, let me let me just talk about regulatory considerations. So next generation sequencing tests um, for this, the intended use described here are currently class three or high risk tests just by regulatory, by legal default, um, because FDA has not um, seen one of these tests and classified it before. Um, we believe that it would be class three or illegally it would have to be class three. However, we believe that it's possible to classify these tests as class two or moderate risk devices um, and the draft guidance outlines what FDA believes it needs to support this classification. So if we received one of these tests, um, initially it would be defined as class three just by, you know, um, by the law. Um, we would request then that um, the test developer submit what's called a de novo request. Um, and we could then um, potentially down classify the test to class two or moderate risk and provide what are called special controls. Um, along in the future, um, and these special controls might make up some of the things that are outlined in this guidance, the type of analytical validation that we would want to see for this, type, for this test type. Um, and finally, um, the guidance um, entertains the possibility that in the future, uh, we might be able to exempt this whole test type from pre-market notification, provided um, that all of these tests are able to meet the special controls outlined in the draft guidance. So the technical recommendations in the draft guidance can serve as general recommendations, um, special controls, and I should just mention for those of you who work in labs, these are not um, sort of like the run level special controls that you might include in an, you know, control as you might include in an experiment. So that's sort of a legal term of art here at the FDA, and these would just mean specific criteria that your test would have to meet. Um, so like those outlined in this draft guidance, um, or they could serve as standards. So um, uh, CDRH, where I work at the FDA, um, has a robust standards recognition program. So far, we've recognized over a thousand different standards um, that are used in the analytical validation of devices and diagnostic tests. Um, so standards are developed um, by standard developing organizations, or SDOs. Um, these are consensus bodies. Um, Usually they're domestic or international, and um, they include experts on the relative. Uh, um, um, they include experts from across um, across um, the area that they're they're putting out a standard on. So um, examples of some standards um, might be the performance characteristics of a test or testing testing methodologies or how the um, 
how to meet uh, QC requirements for your laboratory. Um, in the um, molecular diagnostic space, some of the standards organizations um, that are typically um, working in this area are like a clinical laboratory um, standards institute, CLSI, for example. Um, so if a, if a standard developing organization develops one of these standards, and we hope that um, some of the um, information we've outlined in this guidance would, would make up what that standard would look like, um, FDA could recognize it um, and conformance with that standard um, could support a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness, um, which is our standard to, um, to approve or not approve um, a device. Um, this, of course, would be voluntary if a test developer says, you know, um, that standard's great, but I choose to, you know, validate my test my own way. Um, they could certainly do that and um, come in however they would like to. Um, and then, again, a declaration of conformity um, would be something that um, perhaps an independent third party would assess to make sure that the test developer is meeting the standard for their test. And, um, and that could be used in, um, to, to demonstrate that you've met the standard and therefore your test is analytically valid. So um, one thing I want to say actually about standards before I move forward is that the, the actually move here. The, the, real, the real benefit to using a standards-based approach is that um, when we, issue special controls around a certain test type, um, they're not easily updated by the agency. So um, we, we tend to have a lot of um, policies and bureaucracy that we have to move through, um, but standards developing organizations that could put out a standard with the same information, um, they're often updated annually, and FDA can then recognize each iteration of that standard. Um, so as the technology advances, the standard can be updated um, and FDA can recognize it. So standards move a little bit more quickly than, um, than the FDA can. So, um, and um, another, another thing that would be uh, advantageous is that under our conventional approach, any modifications uh, made to a test would require FDA re-review of that package. Um, However, um, standards could, or modifications, could be one of the components that's included in a standard, um, which would make um, things quite a bit easier um, for a test developer. So if they predefine how they're going to make modifications and validate them, then we wouldn't need to see a resubmission of that issue. Um, of course, um, it, takes, it does take a while for the community to develop standards, and um, I believe those efforts are currently underway. Um, so in the absence of standards or if a test developer is interested in using this approach before a standard um, is put out, um, we can use special controls in that case too. So next, I'd like to take the next few minutes to talk about our second draft guidance, the use of public human genetic variant databases to support clinical validity for next generation based tests. So the benefits to using publicly available genetic databases are obvious. So the evidence housed within them can be generated by multiple parties. Um, aggregated data can provide a stronger evidence base. So um, often with the information that's housed in these genetic databases um, could reflect the current state of scientific knowledge about a, um, a particular variant and is linked to a disease or condition. Um, and as the clinical evidence improves, all of this information gets put into databases um, and the new interpretations about that data could be supported. So databases have the potential to speed evidence development for next generation based tests since the evidence housed in these databases is generated by multiple parties, it's updated quickly and it's really reflective of what's going on in the community.
So to determine whether an NGS-based test has a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness, the agency relies upon the review of valid scientific evidence um, that would need to be the, to support the clinical performance, well, analytical and clinical performance of this test. So this is the definition in statute that FDA um, relies upon. Um, but some examples of what constitute valid scientific evidence are well-controlled investigations, well-documented case histories conducted by qualified experts, reports of significant human experience with a device, um, and peer-reviewed literature. So notably, um, this is also the type of information that could be housed in a publicly accessible database. Um, and so we believe that if, if um, appropriate controls were in place around databases or certain um, quality criteria were met, um, that the data that is housed in publicly accessible databases might uh, meet the definition of valid scientific evidence and could be used to support um, the clinical validity of a test. So in the past, FDA has relied upon, has been able to um, use genetic databases and the assertions that they make um, as evidence of clinical validity for um, approved and cleared devices. So in our first example, a couple years ago, Illumina used a publicly accessible CFTR2 database as a source of evidence for their assay diagnosing cystic fibrosis. Um, we reviewed both the data within the database and the interpretation process that curators used. And based on this evaluation, we thought that the data in the database and the processes used to generate it were sufficient to provide assurance of the clinical validity of the variance reported by the test. Um, and a second example, um, Myriad used its own proprietary database as a source of clinical validity for its BRCA analysis companion diagnostic um, test uh, used in ovarian cancer treatment selection. So FDA reviewed the interpretative process that um, Myriad used to classify variants and again found that the processes they used were uh, sufficient to provide assurance of clinical validity. And it's important to note here that because we reviewed the process by which the interpretation occurs and found that process to be sufficient, Myriad's allowed to report to physicians um, never before seen variants, so newly classified variants that they find. Um, so we believe that these two different decisions provide a model by which genetic variant databases um, can be used to support um, test clinical validity. Um, so the draft guidance we put out last, um, last year um, contains a number of different recommendations for database administrators to demonstrate that their database can be considered a source of valid scientific evidence. The guidance also outlines a voluntary database recognition pathway, so similar to a standards recognition pathway we just uh, discussed. Um, and then the guidance describes how evidence from databases could support the clinical validity of NGS-based tests. So we will next discuss the recommendations in greater detail, um, but broadly they rest upon a couple different pillars. So one, transparency to high quality data, validated processes and formal procedures, expert in, use of expert interpretation and, and what I call data hygiene. Um, and all of these were, were things through our experience with um, CFTR2 and Myriad, we found to be important um, to um, assess, um, to, to making sure that the data housed within the database does meet that definition of valid scientific evidence. So the scope of this guidance document, um, it's only applicable to publicly accessible databases of human genetic variants. So we're not talking about microbial um, genome identification. Um, we're not talking about um, software that's automated and you know automatically classifies or interprets genetic variants. And we're not talking about proprietary databases either. Um, I, I think I think we can skip this, but um, the slides will be available after the fact. I know that in the genetics community, there are a lot of different term of art around um, what things like curation and interpretation mean. Um, but here, for the purposes of this guidance, 
Interpretation means the process by which database personnel evaluate the evidence regarding a link between a variant and a disease or condition, and then how the, um, the link that that database um, personnel comes up with, that's the assertion that um, the database then makes about a genotype-phenotype correlation between a particular variant and disease or condition. So we believe that um, the evidence residing in many of these variant, genetic variant databases um, could meet the definition of valid scientific evidence. And um, we then outline a number of recommendations um, that if a database administrator follows um, could receive FDA recognition for their, for their database. Um, and we believe that then those assertions could be used to support the clinical validity of a test. So as I mentioned earlier, the recommendations really kind of rest in five different buckets. So transparency is key. So we would want to see transparency information about um, your database operations. So um, are things adequately documented? Do you have versioning in place? Do you have um, SOPs for how you um, do things like curate data, pull it in from other sources, evaluate the quality of it, um, how you actually make um, assertions? So, so do you have a robust and validated process underlying how you actually pull all that data together and then make an assertion about the link between a variant and a disease. Uh, we'd also want to see um, use of standardized formats and disclosure of what formats are being used so, um, so people are using the database know what they're looking at. Um, there are a number of recommendations around data quality. So we'd like to see quite a bit of information about the data itself and its sources. So um, what kind of nomenclature you use. Um, we'd like to see some metadata if, if available. So um, uh, the analytical performance of the test used to actually find the variant. Um, for things like somatic variants, we'd want to see information about very little frequency, um, that kind of thing. Um, it's important that you would have SOPs for curation, aggregation, and interpretation and the use of validated decision matrices or um, protocols or scoring systems they use to make those assertions. Um, we also recommend the use of um, reliance upon expert personnel. So we'd want to know that the folks who are actually making these assertions are um, adequately trained, they're experts in their field, um, and we'd also want to see information around disclosure of conflict of interest information. Um, finally, we'd like to see information about database hygiene. So um, are you, does the database follow all applicable privacy security um, principles? And does it have a plan for data preservation in place in case um, the database runs out of money or goes away or something like that? Um, we would want to make sure that this knowledge isn't lost. Um, the, Draft guidance then outlines an FDA recognition path. Briefly, um, if a database is interested in being recognized, they would submit a voluntary request to the FDA for recognition. And I just want to emphasize that this process is voluntary. Um, we are not requiring any databases to come in. Um, and, um, and it's really at the behest of the, the, the folks running the database whether or not they want to come in. Um, they would then send us information about all of the different, how they meet all of the different recommendations that we just outlined. Um, and the guidance also outlines um, processes for maintenance of that recognition. So a periodic review by FDA of all your SOPs, maybe spot checking assertions, things like that. Um, we then believe that if um, an FDA-recognized database makes an assertion is likely to constitute valid scientific evidence and would strongly support the clinical validity of a genotype-phenotype relationship. So if a test developer is interested in um, bringing in a test for a hearing panel and we have said all of these different assertions about the link between these genetic variants and hearing loss, 
our valid scientific evidence, a test developer could point to that database and say, this is what I'm using and this is what I'm reporting out. And it's possible that we would say that that is sufficient on its own and we don't need to see any more clinical data to support the clinical validity of that test. So in summary, um, we believe that this process um, provides a streamlined, a pathway for streamlined evidence generation that takes advantage of the work already being done in the genomics community. And we further believe that this approach offers speed, scalability, and safety. So speed, um, this approach when finalized could provide test developers one efficient path to market and connect patients with the current state of scientific knowledge about their variants. Uh, scalability, test developers, both large and small, can benefit because they all have access to the same publicly available databases for evidence generation. And safety, um, this approach would, would encourage innovation while still sharing patients and healthcare providers that the tests that they use and rely on are safe and effective and provide accurate and meaningful results. Um, and with just a couple minutes left, because I want to make sure to leave time for your questions, we're going to talk about Precision FDA. Oh, first let me put in a plug. Um, for both of these guidance documents, um, they really are community-driven efforts, and so we do need help with by the community. Um, we need folks to help serve on standard developing organizations, bo um, bodies that are going to look at developing these standards. Um, clearly, reference materials are, are clearly important for um, analytical validation of NGS-based tests. Um, data sharing, um, so really building that repository of information in these publicly available databases is key um, to creating sustainable and high-quality databases. And then obviously, a lot of those databases are um, built upon the backs of volunteers, so folks helping out with curation and um, assertions or making assertions is, is critical to, to really uh, realizing this future. So the last couple of minutes, I just want to put a plug in for Precision FDA, which is our community-based platform uh, for NGS assay evaluation and regulatory science exploration. So I just want to be clear, this is a, um, this is a regulatory science um, uh, platform right now. It's not a regulatory um, platform. Um, but what it is, is it's actually just a sort of a sandbox where folks who are doing um, next generation sequencing can upload their bioinformatics pipelines, upload particular pieces or apps within those pipelines, do in silico mutagenesis um, to really challenge their pipelines. Um, and it's a way for, for the whole community to sort of play together. It's um, crowdsourced, um, cloud-based platform. Um, it provides tools and open access resources. So there are, if you were to log in, there are a number of different apps and pipelines already available for you to play around with in there. Um, and it allows the whole community to test and pilot and validate different approaches. So, so far, um, we've had um, over a thousand different users um, create accounts on the site, and these are folks from the entire sort of genomics community. So, test developers, both large and small, NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, um, FDA scientists, scientists from NIH, um, standards bodies, academic centers, um, industry, um, and so on. Um, and so if you were to actually go to the website you would um, and create an account, you would see this landing page. So um, it gives you a taste of what kinds of different things you can do on the platform. So you could upload a file. Um, run a comparison, launch an app, add an app or something like that. Um, and one thing I did not mention here is there are both public and private spaces on the website. So if you, you know, have this new app that you want to try out and you think it's really cool, you can upload it to the public space and have other people play around with it. Um, if you really just want to 
um, tested a couple different pipelines against each other using, you know, files that you generated in your own lab, um, you could do that in your private space and you don't have to share that information with anyone. And just to be clear, when I say with anyone, I mean with anyone, the FDA does not have access to your private space. So um, it, it really is a sandbox for, for folks who are interested in, in this aspect of NGS to play around in. Um, we have done a couple different challenges through um, the uh, through the site in the last couple of um, months, and I should just mention that the site is about 14 months old. We launched it in December of 2015, and so it just had its one-year anniversary. Um, but so far, we've run three challenges. Um, a truth challenge, a consistency challenge, and, as well as an uh, apathon series of challenges to try and get folks to, to um, you know, add new, add new components to, to, um, to the space. Uh, we do plan on running additional challenges in the future so that if you're not quite sure how this might be um, useful for you, maybe um, sign up for an account and and get involved in one of our future challenges. Um, so, um, again, we really want to engage with the community. We think that this platform is a really great way to do so. Um, if you have ideas for types of challenges that you think would really answer interesting scientific questions or help move the ball forward on how um, bioinformatics pi uh, pipelines work, um, get involved with us, submit those challenge ideas to us. Um, we, um, there are discussion forums on Precision FDA, um, other ways for you to get your feedback to us. Um, we're really just interested in hearing what your great ideas are since you're the folks out in the field living and breathing bioinformatics every day. Um, and so with that, uh, I'd ha be happy to open it up for questions, but I just wanted to note that, um, there are a couple different um, email addresses up here. So first is mine. Um, you can get in touch with me with any questions you have. The second is the whole um, precision medicine team here at FDA. And then the third is if you have questions about that platform, Precision FDA, which I admit I didn't do justice to running through it pretty quickly, um, feel free to contact the team there to uh, to get involved, as well as check out the website, which might have a number of your questions answered. Okay, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Um, so one question that um, we often get asked is who do these guidances apply to? So do they apply to labs? Do they only apply to conventional um, diagnosis? Uh, thank you, Dr. Koontz, uh, for your informative presentation. And sorry about that uh, small uh, delay. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Dr. Koontz will answer as many questions as time permits. Okay, um, so without uh, hesitation, let's jump in. The first question asks, who do these guidelines apply to? To labs, conventional IVD manufacturers, et cetera. Um, so, Oh, there I am, sorry. Um, just a technical issue on my end. Um, so they apply to um, their voluntary guide guidelines and they apply to any party that's interested in, in using them. So if, a, if an IVD manufacturer um, thinks that this might be a good approach for, that, for their you know, NGS-based test, um, that they're bringing into the FDA for um, clearance or approval, um, then, then they are certainly free to use this path. If a, if a laboratory that's developing an LDT that wants to um, 
come and seek FDA um, approval or clearance, and they're free to use this as well. Um, it's not, no one is required to use this pathway. I just want to be clear about that. The whole, um, it's all voluntary. Um, we just saw the need for a different um, paradigm for how the agency could review these types of tests and wanted to um, proactively provide one to the community. Thank you for your answer. Our next question asks, will all genetic test developers, including those that do not use NGS-based technologies, be able to use FDA-recognized databases for their submissions? Thanks. Um, so in the, in the draft guidance, we um, proposed that NDS-based test developers um, would be able to use these genetic databases that get FDA that are FDA recognized. Um, however, we see, received a lot of public feedback um, from the community saying that other types of test developers, um, such as you know, um, genetic technologies that rely on just uh, sequencing, like Sanger sequencing or PCR, um, would also be appropriate candidates for this type of um, for using these types of databases. And so um, as we move forward with finalizing the guidances, that's something we're considering and, and I think um, really moving towards um, any, any sort of genetic technology um, could benefit from this pathway. Thank you for your answer. Um, we are, uh, looks like we're running close on time, so we have time for one last question today. And this question asks, who do we contact to open the channels to help? Um, well, um, luckily I've still got my slide up with uh, my email address. Um, so you can contact any, both myself and any anybody else on the PMI or Precision FDA team, depending on what your where your interest lies. Um, we, as I as I've hoped emphasized, um, we really do think about this whole um, this whole effort as being community driven, and so we're really interested in getting community feedback as well as engaging with y'all um, about moving forward. So so please. Feel free to email me, um, email the folks on our team, and, um, and we look forward to working with all of you. I would like to once again thank Dr. Koontz for her presentation. Dr. Koontz, do you have any final comments you'd like to leave us with today? I think I just encourage um, folks to check out um, Precision FDA um, online. Um, it's a really cool tool that um, that I wish we'd have more time to talk about, but um, I think could be useful for many many of your labs. Um, and I really want to thank each and every one of you for your time and attention today. And um, please do be in touch um, regarding um, getting involved. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and thank Lab Roots for today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through May 2017. Lab Roots will alert you via email when it is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. We look forward to seeing, here, seeing you here next time at Lab Roots. Goodbye. <laughs>